Monday, September 12th, 2022, public work session to order. Could we all please stand for the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Good evening and welcome to our guests joining us this evening and welcome also to anyone who might be on our live stream. We have nine of our board members in attendance this evening and as usual, this meeting is being live streamed and can be viewed on the Cornwall Lebanon School District website. Being that this is a work session, I'm going to now turn the meeting over to Dr. Demensic. Thank you, Mrs. Schlegel and welcome to our guests in attendance and anyone that is viewing online. Uh, as this is our September work session, uh, during this meeting, the administration will be presenting items to the Board of School Directors for consideration, review, and discussion. And at the conclusion of the meeting, we will entertain any questions from anyone in attendance, if there are any. Uh, those are our typical guidelines for our work session. So just some uh, general things to, to note here. Uh, this is the format that we used last month for our work session. We're going to continue with that in this setup. This allows our guests in attendance to see the screen a little bit better uh, and also for us just to have more conversation that we're not way across the room. So we'll continue with that. Uh, we have had a very smooth opening to the 2022-2023 school year. And as we look at this year, we really are back to pre-COVID routines and scheduled uh, we are very fortunate as we hear some of these staffing issues that exist uh, across the Commonwealth or across the country. While we have some challenges with some of our classified positions, overall we are doing very well with our staffing. Uh, we also had our open houses for all of our parents in all six buildings. Uh, we're very, very well attended, particularly at our elementary schools, very well attended. And of course we have our athletic competitions that are well underway and we are seeing a lot of guests and spectators in attendance, which is very nice to see. There was a news item that came out last week <clears throat> about the school meals, and this is governing uh, free breakfast. So it's, it's important to note that this is about universal free breakfast is what this is. And during the COVID time, we actually had universal free meals for everyone. That ended at the start of the school year, and we are now looking at universal free breakfast being implemented for this school year is based on the information that we had received uh, from the governor and from the Department of Education la late last week. We will be communicating this with families. We need to be very clear that we do have some students who may be eligible for free or reduced lunches, and so that's a difference. It's just a difference, and now there is a certification process, which is what we had prior to COVID-19. So we're going back to that with the exception being, of course, these free breakfasts. So more information will be coming out to students. We'll have that channel through the Skyward Message Center as well. And we do encourage if there are any students or families, families that believe that their children are eligible to please look on the district website to submit that application. Uh, we do have that available. We will have a number of topics that are discussed this evening. These include our district and healthy safety plan. We are looking at some revisions to codify what our current practices are. Uh, we will have a year-end financial report for 21-22 school year, some other policy updates. Uh, we will need to also have an executive session at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, we actually have, we do have students that are still in our virtual education programs, a, a smaller number but we actually have an open house for them this Thursday. So we've concluded our other open houses, but we have the, this Thursday. And our next voting meeting is set for next Monday here in the LGI. So before we jump into the agenda, I also want to note uh, Mrs. Schott, this is her last meeting. So thank you, Bonnie, for your service to the district of 35 years. Thank you. We appreciate everything you've done, I certainly do, in, in all of your efforts uh, in assistant superintendent's office, the board, and we certainly wish you well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, we will move into our agenda here, and we'll go to buildings and grounds. Mrs. Sands. 
Thank you. First item we have tonight under buildings and grounds is the partial reviewing project. Um, I did talk about a change order coming through last month. Um, I do have it posted and it is a, about the amount that we had estimated. Um, a portion of it has to do with the prevailing wage. The state had changed the wage amount in May significant enough that um, the vendor is requesting to have a change order done for that. There were also minor repairs to the uh, roof at Ebenezer and also the middle school. Um, so that would be covered under the $6,081 change order that we'll have for your approval next week. Next item um, we have is the buildings and grounds uh, semi-annual report. We do uh, this in September and we also do it in, it's either April or May. Um, the report is pretty lengthy for, um, we have Daniel Brickley, now the supervisor of buildings and grounds. He provided very detailed report. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of areas um, with each building. So at the Cornwall Elementary School, we had the minor parking lot and bus loop resurfaced. We did talk about that previously and got it approved. Um, guidance suite carpet replacement we had approved um, as a part of the, the budget panel upgrade to temperature control system that also included South Lebanon. I'll talk briefly about that, but that is complete. And then we also have the stone wall repairs that we had talked about um, previously and the next availability for the vendor to do it would be this fall. So we're looking at October and um, he's looking at also power washing some of it um, to uh, freshen it up a little bit with the fixture. This is phase one of phase uh, a two phase project, which the uh, remaining part of it will be done in the summer. <clears throat> Ebenezer Elementary, just a few things. Um, we do have uh, the significant part of the the roofing project had to do with Ebenezer and the flat areas. And then also the fire alarm panel, was, there was an upgrade with the fire alarm panel at that building. For South Lebanon, um, the panel upgrade is pending due to back ordering of supplies, believe it or not. Um, we have repairs to playground equipment uh, that we're looking at and th those pieces of equipment are also delayed. Um, but once we get those, we'll get those uh, fixed up. Minor carpet repairs made in the library and computer lab. And then also the sidewalk. I have a, just a snapshot of where the sidewalk's going in to connect on the east side of the building, or the south side. For Union Canal Elementary School, uh, directional signage was installed as a, it's just a follow-up to the renovation there. And then there's a couple of minor tweaks in the programming updates to the fire panel. For Cedar Crest Middle School, just want to highlight the, the partial roofing. That was another um, building that had a roofing project in place. Replacement of a rooftop air conditioning unit and then also carpet repairs in the main office. For the high school, um, hot water tank replacement was done. That's complete. Um, dehumidifier unit above the pool was replaced. We also have pool maintenance every three, three to five years. We should be draining the pool and putting in fresh water. So this, that was done. Um, and then the alumni gym a wood floor was cut to allow expansion. It is currently closed. We're waiting for it to um, go down to the original flat surface. So hopefully that will cooperate within the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll, we'll see to know what the next steps are for that. And then also we had talked about the chiller testing. Um, it, but good news, it did pass the test to be rebuilt. So that is the next step is for rebuilding that unit up here at the high school. For the district grounds, um, anybody is aware with the clip trailer in the back of the middle school that is completely taken away and we have seeded it. So to the point where you can't even tell it was there. I mean. The grass is kind of new there, but it is um, done with uh, planting. Um, a couple of sinkhole repairs, and um, we're also looking at preventative exterior insect program implemented to try to do more of preventative. Um, and then also grounds clean up to occur this fall. We do have some dead trees around the campus and also um, just some of the trees need trimming. So we'll look at that. And we're also looking at removing the trees over at the warehouse. 
district-wide, uh, regular summary preventative maintenance and annual cleaning like we do every summer, um, includes filters and cleaning the floors. Um, we're all, we also looked at a new maintenance work order ticket system implemented. That was one of the uh, things that I wanted to have done this, this year, and we uh, worked with the same system that our technology department uses so that it was a, a better transition there. And then we're also looking at training custodial maintenance staff coming all together um, here at the high school on October 10th. So again, those are highlights. The full report is in board docs for you to review. Do you have any questions? I, I would just like to commend Mr. Brickley for that excellent report and Dr. Domenzi for the whole overview you went around and surveyed the buildings and made lists and I'm, I'm so happy to have this all going forward. I'm married to a former contractor, so I really read this stuff. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Brickley's new in his role. We're very pleased with how he jumped right in and is uh, taking charge of that. He's doing a very nice job. The gym floor, <coughs> we cut the, for the expansion. Is there a method that we could put like a roller across the floor to kind of flatten it out rather than to try to wait? And we time? haven't tried rollers, but we've tried weights. Okay. But you have to be careful with how much you put yeah. all at once. But we have tried that. Okay. And it really hasn't shown much. Um, our humidity here, it, it's hard with the system, the chillers in place to be able to get the humidity down. Um, we did have a renovation company come in to take a look to see how to approach it. And they said unless we get the humidity down, it, it's really not going to settle completely. And we won't see what its potential is. So hopefully the weather will will break and we'll get some relief there. Okay, thanks. Okay, do we have any other questions regarding buildings and grounds? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Hens. We'll go on to community relations curriculum and staff development. And Dr. Bosman, I think you have the first one here. Yes, back at the August 8th meeting, we reviewed the agreement with First Aid and Safety Patrol, and that was approved on the 15th. This is the follow-up to this. This is the list of instructors for that program. And this will be on for approval next week? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Rackley. Good evening, everybody. I'm excited to just provide an update for our um, professional learning that we did at the start of the school year with our staff. Um, we had a very successful learning focused schools training where we used a train the trainer model, meaning we had um, a trainer from learning focused schools come and train our teachers, and then our teachers and administrators were our trainers for our staff. Um, looking ahead, we're going to continue to use our professional learning time throughout the school year to continue that focus on teaching and learning that we've been talking about so much. And we're going to use that time to collaborate, practice, communicate, um, provide application time um, to emphasize that research-based best instructional practices for our staff um, as they come back um, face to face with our students. And then um, just as a reminder, when we think about our comprehensive plan, um, this professional development, this ongoing professional learning really focuses on our priority number one, which was um, curriculum and instruction continuity. Absolutely. And that's really what the message that we've delivered to all of our staff and to our students as well is this is getting back to basics. As I said to staff, back to the future, right? Going back to those things that actually worked uh, prior to all of this, knowing that that teaching and learning is really the emphasis. So I appreciate all the efforts of uh, Dr. Rackley, the administration, and all of our teachers, too, who have really just embraced this and, and continued this. When you go around our schools, that's what you see, teaching and learning taking place. And that's a good thing. That's where we need to be. That's what's best for our students and for our community. Any questions about community relations, curriculum, staff development. I'm just curious how many trainers we have that are teachers here. If you know, I mean, I'm just really curious about that. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs>
Mm, very good. Good. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions about that section? All right. We'll go on to extracurricular. And we have some summer camp updates. These are things that took place. We thought we'd just give you an update. You approved motions for these to occur over the summer. So we just want to let you know how they happen, the participation level. So Dr. Bosman's going to take a couple. Dr. Rackley will take uh, one for federal programs. So go ahead. Okay, this first one is for the Falcon Summer Science Camp. Um, this took place July 18th to the 22nd at Union Canal Elementary School. We had seven teachers uh, that were part of this. We had 140 students from third through fifth grade. Uh, part of the program, we had assemblies. We had a reptile assembly. We had a rocket assembly. You'll see there in the attached document, there was a survey sent out to all of the families. So those are their responses plus some individual comments from families, which were very positive about it. Uh, so it was very well received. Hopefully we can do this again uh, this coming year, but it was very well received by the parents and students. And as you can see up there, um, some of the topics, there was a theme for each day, water science, plants and insects, weather science, rockets and explosions, and energy and electricity. Okay, the next one is on credit recovery. Uh, this uh, took place over the summer. Uh, and if you look at the attachments in there, you'll notice that uh, the, the decrease in the amount of students that were needing of this additional support. For the middle school in 2021, there were 48 students. And for this uh, most recent summer, it was half that number at 24. And then at the high school in 2021, it was 115 students and then down to 79 more recently. Once again, this is credit recovery for students um, that was offered over the summer. But as you can see, the trend is in a positive direction. So we're glad to see those numbers returning a little bit closer to what would be a normal type of situation that we would have over the summer, but also glad that we could offer that service. Were these students that, uh, that recovered the credit or just the participants for the... For the, the were these the students that recovered credits or were they just like, these are the number of we had participating? It would be both, actually, but most of this is for this is secondary, so this is going to be credit recovery at the secondary level. Okay. All right. Um, this the camp that I get to talk about is our ESL English as a Second Language Summer Camp. Um, we were able to um, serve 27 English learners. This is a Title III funded program, which falls under federal programs, which is why this would be my slide. Um, we were able to serve um, students in kindergarten through ninth grade, and we were able to work with 35 different families. And it was lovely to see some of our kiddos come with their siblings and get to spend some quality time learning together. Um, in terms of staffing, we had six professional staff, a nurse and a secretary who support this program. And I think my favorite part of this conversation is the fact that we had seven high school students who were able to fulfill their project life job shadow requirement through our camp. So it was a really nice um, way to dovetail, dovetail those two programs together. In terms of content, they had a great time. They uh, focused on astronomy, life cycles and the environment. And then again, probably my favorite, is the farm to table piece that they did, which culminated in a tour of the Lebanon County Fairgrounds and a tr field trip to the Lebanon County Fair. Um, some of our students had never been able to do that, had never seen the animals up close before. And so it was just a really lovely experience for them to be able to do that. And then of course, make homemade ice cream too. <laughs> Who wouldn't love that? So we had a lot of activity going on here over the summer and at some of the different buildings, not only here on the campus, but also at, at our elementary schools. So just thought we'd give you an update about some of the participation we have with those various programs. Are there any questions about any of them? Those are excellent programs. And once again, kudos to our maintenance and custodial staff who managed to get the whole thing cleaned up and back together in spite of all that. 
Yes. Uh, they have to work around all yes, that. Yes, I used to do the suburb ed program, and so I heard about it regularly. So way to go. <laughs> of course, that's another one that's going on, too. That's a whole other thing that's happening, too. Yeah. All right. Use of facilities requests. Okay, we have a couple of requests here. Um, we have the elite baseball, Cedar Crest High School, varsity baseball, using the, the baseball field for tournaments. Um, we are looking for a ratification for this coming weekend, the 17th and 18th. They did have a field reserved somewhere else and they lost that, that reservation, so they're asking to use our field this coming weekend as well as the uh, next four, four weekends through October, the middle of October. Um, we also have the American Cancer Society looking to use the high school gym, ground, stadium, and a field house for the um, Relay for Life that they come every year to use our facility. Um, for the Sunday use of facilities, we are looking at the Cedar Crest Middle School Parents uh, School Partners um, using the facility on a Sunday um, for their fundraiser and the um, snow date would be Sunday, February 5th. So we are looking to approve that since it is a Sunday request. The hours are 12 to 6.30 on Sunday. Okay. That's our use of facilities. We have some field trip requests also. We do have a couple of field trips, just uh, two of them for FFA. One to Sharon Harrisburg Hershey, Saturday, Sunday, February 11th and 12th, 2023, for the ACES Leadership Conference. And then also they are heading to same place Sunday to Tuesday, March 26th, 28th, 2023, for the State Legislative Leadership Conference. So those are two field trips that will need approval since it is an overnight and some days. Okay, and these items will be on next week. Yes. All right, any questions about any of those items under extracurricular? Okay. We'll go on to finance and business. So Mrs. Hens, if you want to continue. Okay, um, several years ago, we had gotten approval from you to have um, Mr. West Benson as a representative to open up a project to cover uh, some expenditures from the pandemic. And we utilized um, and we requested coverage for about $76,000 to cover cleaning cafeterias after each period and then also deep cleanings based on COVID numbers. Um, it's a two-year project. I did have you acknowledge last year in receipt of, of a portion of this, and then the remainder is going to come here. We received $32,446, which is 90% of the project that, of what we requested. And then once this project closes out, we'll receive the additional 10%, um, which again is a total of 76000 And then we'll just ask for your acknowledgement next week on the receipt of it. Next item is uh, a review of the year end. This is preliminary. We've been working with the auditors um, and we'll be working with them again on site in the next couple of weeks. Um, these, are, these are the numbers that I'm estimating. Um, with the revenue versus a budget, we're looking at, uh, we were over 7.7%. A majority of that variance is the earned income tax and real estate interim and transfer taxes. And these are one-time differences because of the pandemic just has everything out of whack right now. And it's very hard to predict um, how much is gonna come in. Um, state revenues, as you know, we have to approve our budget before the state approves theirs. So there's always variances there. Um, and then the federal revenue, it's one-time money with the Pima, what I just talked about, the assistance there. And then also the stimulus money, which is the American Rescue um, Plan uh, funds that will eventually stop coming through. So we want to make sure that we are looking at what we have continuously. But 7.7% um, um, is 
Not too bad when we're talking a $90 million budget. As for the expenditures on the next slide, um, we were within 1.5% of expenditures to budget. Um, some of the items that were under budget is personnel and probably mainly has to do with not being able to fill some of the positions. Um, third party cyber charter schools, we, we, are, we do have a little bit of control over, over um, how many are going to third parties. So we've been kind of pushing the gas on that to make sure that we we're in contact with them. And then also conferences and travel fees back in 21-22. There weren't conferences yet, and hopefully we'll see that we're able to go to more conferences and training more this year. Um, expenditures that were over budget, virtual cost, a um, little on the high end. We are coming down with the amount uh, enrolled in our virtual programs, um, but purchase of property uh, services um, with the high school and middle school, um, some of the the maintenance we're looking at covering, um, and then special education costs are, those are not predictable, but we try our best to cover those. And then supplies and equipment, a lot of those have to do with the pandemic and inflation, um, looking at the variances there. Again, that was 1.5%. So just in summary, on the next slide, um, we're looking at, uh, I'm recommending to do an assigned fund balance of 5.5 million to campus project. Um, most of this will probably cover in the inflation that we're gonna be looking at with this project. Uh, we also had a couple years ago, we put um, $1 million into virtual education because we weren't sure what that would look like. Um, right now we're starting to control this a little more, so I'm asking to take half of that and put it into campus project to, again, try to cover some of the inflation that we're gonna be facing in the next couple of years. And then um, transfer 1.3 million to capital reserve for future projects. Um, right now we're, we are, um, we have the domestic hot water heater we're looking at over at Ebenezer, so that will definitely help with that. Um, and then for the unassigned fund balance at the end of the year, we're looking at about $7 million. And again, that's under the state requirement of 8%. So again, that's just a summary of what we're looking at for year end. Um, we'll have our auditors come in in November to give uh, an overall report of where we actually came in at. I know as we've talked about over the last couple of years, these have just been incredibly challenging budget times, predictions and unknown variables and unknown expenses about where we're going to end up and what's going to be one time, what's going to be permanent. And we still don't have all the pieces to that figured out. Um, but we're also trying to look forward to the future of where we go with needs, with buildings and projects as well. Now, let me note that the, the, what we're talking about here is the general fund. I am going to be reporting next month where we came in in health care. And right now we're looking at a preliminary loss of $1.6 million. So, but I'll address more of next month on that. Any questions about the finance and business items? Okay, we'll move on to personnel. Okay, for the first item, I'm going to let Dr. Long talk a little bit about the request for the approval of creation of a position. Yeah, to just kind of summarize this, uh, we um, contracted with the IU um, to provide secondary autistic support um, in uh, looking at those support services and some of uh, the staffing and how we could help uh, each other is mutually beneficial for us to go ahead and um, have an in-house autistic support instructor. This will be a special education position. And then we would be contracting uh, about a 0.6 position through IU coverage. Uh, so we are looking for that. Um, it is um, something that uh, budgetary wise is kind of a kind of a wash, uh, maybe even a little bit of, of a saving. So we we're looking to bring that one position in house, a secondary special education teacher.
Okay, I'm going to go through these personnel items. The first, just to follow up from what Dr. Long said, approve the creation of the following positions. Autistic support instructor, long-term substitute, secondary level for the 2022-2023 school year. Accept the following retirements, resignations, and rescindments. Cecilia Kramer, long-term substitute, Spanish instructor, Cedar Crest High School, effective September 1st, 2022 due to resignation. Victoria Roberts, assistant girls soccer coach, 50% effective August 11th, 2022 due to resignation. Wendy Marini, assistant swimming coach, effective August 23rd, 2022 due to resignation. Edward Barr, personal care assistant, part-time South Lebanon Elementary School, effective August 1st, 2022 due to resignation. Tamara Gilmartin, Primary Assistant, Ebenezer Elementary School, effective August 1st, 2022, due to resignation. Rochelle Deicher, Personal Care Assistant, Cornwall Elementary School, effective August 10th, 2022, due to resignation. Carolyn Lentz, Cafeteria Proctor, Ebenezer Elementary School, effective August 19th, 2022, due to resignation. Vicki Kaufman, Personal Care Assistant, Ebenezer Elementary School, effective September 1st, 2022, due to resignation. Georgiana Chiratois, Instructional Assistant, Special Education, Ebenezer Elementary School, effective September 1st, 2022, due to resignation. Rachel Richardson, Instructional Assistant, Special Education, Cedar Crest High School, effective September 16th, 2022 and Jean Drabellis Jr., Ground Supervisor, effective, September, effective December 31st, 2022, due to retirement. There's a note there. Uh, those designated above with an asterisk will continue employment with the Cornwall Lebanon School District as a substitute, and those with two asterisk marks will be as a primary assistant. Okay, the next approve the following request for leave. Jill Houts, Health and Physical Education Instructor, South Lebanon Elementary School, Professional Development Leave, effective the second semester of the 2022-2023 school year. Approve the changes in employment status. Casey Shillabier, from part-time 50% assistant girls soccer coach to full-time assistant girls soccer coach, at a salary of 3,937, effective August 21st, 2022. Anna Leonard, from building assistant to school secretary front desk, Cedar Crest High School, effective September 6, 2022, at an hourly wage of $14.46. Ratify the employment of the following personnel. Joey Leal, guidance counselor, South Lebanon Elementary School, at a salary of 58,316, prorated based on receipt of certification, effective August 23rd, 2022. Matilda Reyes, long-term substitute, Spanish instructor, Cedar Crest High School at a salary of 53,720, prorated based on a start date, effective September 6, 2022. Kelly Snyder, induction mentor for Matilda Reyes at a salary of $900. <coughs> Sorry. Jessica Zerman, Personnel Secretary, Educational Service Center, at an hourly wage of $17.20, effective September 6, 2022. Thomas Capello, Food Service Helper, 4.5 hours. Cedar Crest High School, at an hourly wage of $14.25, effective September 6, 2022. Approve the employment of the following personnel effective with the 2022-2023 school year, pending completion of pre-employment materials. Brittany Moyer, Guidance Counselor, Cedar Crest Middle School, at a salary of 63570 prorated based on start date. Melissa Lotz, Assistant Fall Play Director, Cedar Crest Middle School, at a salary of $1,020. Melissa Lotz, Assistant Play Director, Cedar Crest Middle School at a salary of $1,020. Nikwan Howell, District Custodian, Cedar Crest Middle School at an hourly wage of $14.25. Thomas Arnold, District Custodian, Cedar Crest Middle School at an hourly wage of $14.25. Radion Lazé, District Custodian, Cornwall Elementary School at an hourly wage of $14.25. Dorothy Rumpf, 
personal care assistant, 6.5 hours. Ebenezer Elementary School at an hourly wage of $15.25. Melissa Lopes, instructional assistant, special education, 6.5 hours. Ebenezer Elementary School at an hourly wage of $15.25. Donald Thiel, building assistant, 6.75 hours. Cedar Crest Middle School at an hourly wage of $14.10. Robert Siegenfuss, building assistant, 5.75 hours. Cedar Crest Middle School at an hourly wage of $14.10. Jessica Mays, building assistant, 5.75 hours. Cedar Crest High School at an hourly wage of $14.10. Amelia Williams, primary assistant, Cornwall Elementary School at an hourly wage of $12.10. Desiree Jimenez, primary assistant, South Lebanon Elementary School at an hourly wage of $12.10. Elizabeth Kishball, primary assistant, Cornwall Elementary School at an hourly wage of $12.10. And John Freeman, the second event worker. Approve volunteer coaches, Sarah Sweeta, cross country. And this next item, is uh, really in response to our need for to be able to continue to hire, especially custodial and cafeteria food service people, and to be able to get them on board sooner rather than later. So for the remainder of the 2022-23 school year, grant authorization to the administration to hire personnel to be ratified at subsequent board meetings. All right, those, <clears throat> those are our personnel items that will be on the agenda for next week. Uh, we may have a few other items as well. If they come up, we'll let you know about them, just things that happen in the course of this week. Are there any questions about any of those personnel items? I do have a question for Dr. Long. The autistic need at the high school, is that presently being met? Is it a new student, or do we just have too many students, or what's, what's going on? Um, this was uh, just something that um, we had contracted with the IU, so it wasn't, it, it's not a really big change in services. Okay, so it's, there's already a place, there's already kiddos in a place being yes. taught. It was now just a change in who's doing the services. That's exactly right. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bosman, Dr. Long. <clears throat> we will move on to policy and management. And the first item that we have on here, you may have heard about this in the media, were the uh, physical, the mental health and physical school safety grants, which were allocated upon different amounts to different districts. Let Dr. Bosman talk a little bit about this. This is one-time funds, uh, but we had a deadline of August 31st to submit this. So submit the grant or forego any chance of having any of these funds. That's pretty much how it works. So we had to come up with something very quickly over a, a few weeks here as the school year started. So Dr. Bosman, do you want to go ahead and explain that? Okay, well, as Dr. Demensic said, we found out about this in mid to late July about this uh, grant covering basically two areas. It was two separate grants, each one for about 172,764, one for mental health, the other for physical school safety. Uh, it was opened on August 1st and was due by the end of the month. We submitted ours on August 30th, and we're waiting word from them about the status, and they're, as you can imagine, inundated with 500 or so of these. Uh, so this covers the 2022-2023 school year and the 2023-2024 school year. For the mental health side of this, we are using the funding to provide 1.5 counselors. And I'll just go back to Dr. Long talked about a more comprehensive counseling plan back in August. So this sort of is part of that plan in supporting uh, our students with their social and emotional needs. Uh, the physical school safety is on the next slide. So once again, a similar amount of 172,764. Uh, the funding would be used to hire an additional police officer. 
equipment and supplies, the student assistance program or SAP, not the specific training for that, because that is free, but would cover some of the costs for substitutes to cover those classrooms. And we had some staff participate in a 3E training, Escape, Enhance, and Engage, which is a newer take on Alice, which we had used before. So that was with John Baker from IU 13. So as with any type of grant, and many of these are one-time funds, and we have to look at then how we build these into the future to make sure they're sustainable, which I know Mrs. Hens and I have talked about ways that we can do that, because that is something that we would intend to do, is to have these things be long-term, but it's an appropriate use of these grant funding if it is, if it is allocated to us. And hopefully we'll find that out sooner rather than later. Okay. Any questions about those items? Okay, we'll go on next to our <clears throat> health and safety plan. And we had a lot more discussion, of course, about health and safety plans in school districts last year. Uh, the health and safety plan uh, that we have here is really, as I said at the beginning of the year, this is reflecting <clears throat> and putting into practice, putting, codifying what we're already doing. So as I had shared earlier, we are having a very normal start to this school year. So we are required to have a health and safety plan as, as part of our responsibility under the ESSER grant. So we have to continue this, and this will even be into next year as well, because we can expend some of the ESSER funds in the next year to continue with the health and safety plan. The plan is required to be submitted to the Department of Education, and then when we update it, we have revisions that are submitted as well. So Dr. Bosman, has reviewed the health and safety plan and looked at some of the things that are no longer relevant or uh, that we no longer need to do. There have been changes in the CDC guidance. Uh, we've talked about some of these things such as our, our dashboard, the teachers disinfecting desks, uh, the contact tracing that were very, very early in the stages, mandatory quarantining, which uh, we did not do during the course of last year. Uh, we noticed that it was very important for students to be in school so that they can learn, and particularly also for their mental health. Uh, we also talked about how going into this year, we do have an immunization and communicable disease policy, which was revised in 2017. Prior to that, it was revised in 2003. So this policy has been in existence for quite a few years that governs this. So our plan is flexible here, so we have us following the immunization and communicable disease policy, which still gives us the right, if a student is sick or ill or has symptoms, to send them home, which has always been the case under that policy. Uh, we would require doctor's notes if students are out for a period of time, have students follow the guidance and advice of their physicians or health care providers. So this plan is still flexible, it still would have us following just as we did last year. If there were any orders or mandates, we would continue. The plan states that, that we would follow such orders or mandates. And it is also revisable, meaning this is not, it's subject to revision. This is not, just like it wasn't before, it's not cast in stone. Uh, and we would continue to review these. Dr. Bosman will continue to review any of the recommendations with our pandemic team. Uh, we've been in regular communication with our nurses, as well just to hear what's happening in the buildings uh, and, and what type of traffic is coming in our office and, and how that's being managed. So the plan, as you see, it's different and it reflects those changes that I, that I talked about. We would have to have this just as we did before. This would be on for a vote then just to, to vote on this plan. Are there any questions about the plan? Okay, so that will be an agenda item for next week then, for next Monday. We have the next item on here is the Pennsylvania School Boards Association officer election. This is an annual item, and there is a link there for our Board of School Directors. I don't think you have a whole lot of choices about the candidates for office. Uh, this is for the statewide organization for PSBA. As a board, you vote to cast one 
ballot. Uh, so we would have to have these on there. I suppose, uh, Ms. Carpenter, as you're the PSBA representative, our recommendation, if you confer with the rest of the board, would be to have these names on there unless we hear otherwise mm -hmm. yes. than to be voted on next week. So unless there is some objection from the rest of the board, that's what we would do. Okay. All right, thank you. We have a number of policies on here, but when you look at the policies, you see that <clears throat> some of these are new and some of these are retired. And PSBA has changed their formatting for policies. At one time, they had policies for administrative, professional, and classified employees. As they've shifted in their policy reviews, they've combined those into one set of personnel policies. So we're trying to gradually change our policies to reflect that and reflect some of the nuances that might exist between different groups of employees. But again, that's what the purpose of it is. So that's why you see some of these policies being retired, and then you see one that's for new employees. So you see that under vacation. The one change from last month is, is that for employees that are hired for 12-month employees is that they would need to work 60 days prior to being eligible for vacation. Uh, the tobacco and vaping products is also on there as well. Uh, that policy, which you talked about, that's for uh, all of that replaces, is replaced by employees. Uh, we have a policy on there about overtime and comp time usage as well, which I know we talked about last month. So those policies would be on for final adoption. And under sick leave, we have, again, the administrative, professional, and classified policies are then combined into one policy as it's all put together. And there are certain things in the school code that govern that, but uh, we also have policies about that with sick leave. Probably the biggest thing there when it comes to vacation and sick leave is for, uh, for classified and administrative employees that are 12 months about how some of those things are utilized. So that's what we have for policies. Are there any questions about those items? Okay, we'll go on. I think we have everything there. I know there's a lot of policies listed there because the ones that are retired are in there too. Uh, we'll go on to pupil services and food service. And we have one item here. I think Dr. Long, you have this item, right? Yes, we'll be asking for your uh, permission next week to ratify the special education plan. It was presented last month in August and then uh, put out there for public posting. We have a mandatory period of 28 days. We have exceeded that, um, so we're asking to finalize that and we can send it off to PDE. Did you get any public comment on it? I'm just asking. I did not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Long. And then we have under technology and transportation uh, Mrs. Hentz, I believe you have these, these items here. I have a couple of the items, yeah. Um, transportation contract addendum. Um, if, I don't know if you remember back in June of 2020, um, at the height of the pandemic, we did uh, approve a f an addendum um, with the uh, contract of the van contractor, D.B. Fisher. And one of the items was to um, pay them for the remainder of the year um, due to the buses not being on the road, but they had overhead costs, et cetera. Part of that addendum also um, provided us with a freeze for the cost index. They were gracious enough in the situation um, to freeze the cost index, which is what they see as their increase from year to year. So what I would like to do is put in a second addendum to be able to reverse that specific section where it calls out the freezing of the, the cost index so I can make their contract whole again. And then I'll have that on for next week. And the, uh, the difference is 26,000. It makes the contract reflect what it originally was going forward. Okay, and then um, the other um, item I have is the district transportation vans. Over the last four years, I have been trying to get a van to replace um, our lease van. Uh, we usually do purchase after the lease, and it's just not an option this time. Um, and I, instead of 
trying to find a van that's under co-stars, which is very hard to do, I'm just going to go out to bid, and I'm um, recommending to add another van to the fleet while I'm going out to bid. I'm going to ask for two vans. Right now we have three um, for use by the, the schools to be able to do field trips and um, work to... Uh, uh, yeah, it's the learning support also uses the vans every day, um, but we mostly use it for clubs to be able to get to their activities when there's a small group of kids. So what I'm looking at doing is doing a bid for a, a five to seven passenger van to cover those smaller groups of, of kids. But again, I'm asking for two, so this would put four in the fleet. Because one of them is? One of them is on lease, lease right now, and we're going to return that one. Do the job trainers use our vans? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll be asking for authorization to go out to bid for these two vans. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Heads. If, if what we could find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably white, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, not, not red there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are some limitations we have here within the county. We have to be careful about that. We do prefer blue and gray, but we'll accept white, right? So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We'll see what we get. Yep. Dr. Boswell, you can take this last item here. Okay. For this next one, there's an attachment there listing the names of 10 van drivers to be uh, hired by D.B. Fisher, so that list is attached there as well. Okay. Are there any questions about any of the items under technology and transportation? Are there any questions from any of our board directors about any of the items that we have presented, shared this evening? Are there any questions from anyone in attendance about any of the items that we've discussed? Yes. This year, correct? It is new. It, last year, under under the COVID relief funds, there were both free lunch and free breakfast. Okay. They, they were universally free for all students. Okay. That is new as of last week. Meaning that it is now, it was not currently. We still do have some students that might qualify for free or reduced lunch and mm -hmm. breakfast because we have a breakfast program. Okay. So what would happen is, is that that would be universally free for all students. And that would be funded by the state by some of the information that was put out last week from the governor's office. Okay. Is that like a one-time do they calculate each student into that? And is it a stipend like per student? Or it is. Kind of it's a per student whole. based upon per participation is how that typically works and then they set the reimbursement rates and that's how that works. So kind of as you go through if you don't have say you have 50 percent participating that would be adjusted? It's adjusted based upon your participation levels. Just as it was for during COVID when we had universal meals it was based upon the participation rate and then there were different reimbursement rates that were set by the state for that. Do you find, do you think there's a lot of need for the breakfasts within the community here? I think there's more than people realize. Okay. I think that, yes, I do. I do believe that. And I think that's one thing that from many of our families during the last two years when we had universal lunches and breakfasts, and then we even had students during the first year of COVID, we had about 20% of our students that were virtual. We were able to provide packets for them and a whole week's worth of meals. Mm -hmm. We had a very high participation rate from families. Mm -hmm. And the feedback we had is that people were very grateful for that. And probably, too, with the cost of everything yes. going up, uh, depending on situations, that might be more. Thank you. And thank you all for what you do each month and each, each year. Thank you. Are there any other questions about any of the items from anyone in attendance that we've, we've talked about this evening? Okay. That concludes our items, Mr. Schlegel.
Hey, thank you, Dr. Demensic, and thank you all for providing all the useful information that you did this evening, and also uh, for your thorough planning for the opening of a successful school year. We appreciate it very much. Um, I also will um, echo what Dr. Demensic um, said. We do have an executive session um, after our meeting, and that will be for the purpose of a student discipline issue and personnel. So, right now, the meeting is concluded, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion, second to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.